Hey everybody. Today I'm doing a deeper dive into a simple linear regression in R using the built-in air quality data set. The phrase simple linear regression is a little bit deceptive. There's so much depth, so much complexity to even the simplest linear regression that a longer conversation is really valuable, both in its own right and as you start building skills to move on in your machine learning journey. So here I am in R, I've pulled up the help file on the air quality data set. I'm not gonna talk too much about that, except to say that we've got air quality measurements from New York in 1973, and that I'm gonna be viewing this as a simple random sample in this video, not thinking of it as time series data. Now, in a more sophisticated consideration of this data set, we would wanna think of it as potentially a time series analysis where, core, where observations from adjacent days might tend to be correlated. Um, I'm loading up the tidy models pa family of packages to start, even though I'm not going to be explicitly using the tidy models framework here. It just is going to get in a lot of things that I really want, a lot of the packages that I really want. In particular, um, let me just get this to be a bit more visible here if I can. I'm going to be doing some ggplot. I always end up doing some dplyr, it seems like. I want to make sure I show some functionality from the broom package that's in that's extremely useful and uh, I feel like I had one other in mind here. Again, this isn't intended to be a full deep dive into tidy models, but I'm going to use some of the stuff in there. So let's take a look at the, um, the air quality data set with the view command. It's kind of nice to have that in the uh, in the viewer so that we can refer to it. So we have um, 153 observations of air quality in New York City in, in 1973. I'm going to be focused on the relationship between wind and temperature, with wind being my explanatory variable, and temperature being my response. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is to take this data set of 153 observations and split it into two pieces to start. I want one piece with which to train a model and another piece with which I can potentially evaluate the model. If, if we only look at metrics that tell us how good a model is based on the data that's used to create the model, we're gonna get a bit of a, uh, a rosy picture because the model is specifically built to fit the data that we're using. So it doesn't make sense to evaluate it on that same data. Um, here's where I really wanna use some tidy models functionality. I'm going to set a seed of zero, that's going to reset my random number generator, and that's going to ensure that the work I do is exact, gives the same answers that you'll get if you do these on your home machine. So we'll have the same pseudo random numbers generated on both ends. Maybe I'll put a heading here, um, split data. and. Um, the tidy models family of packages makes it really easy to split a data set into a test and training set. The syntax is to take the data set that we've got and apply the initial split function to it. And so I'll apply initial split to air quality. And I'm going to want to save the result as uh, how about AQ split for air quality. Now the an, um, initial split function is going to give us by default a three to one split. So 75% going into a training set, 25% going into a testing set. You can modify that by adding a, an argument in here. I think it's prop. Okay, so now let's get AQ train by taking the training part of that AQ split. And let's get AQ test to be the testing part of AQ split. There we go. And let's just pause and look in the environment tab here where you can see we have AQ test is 39 observations, AQ train is 114. Again, that's 75%, 25%. Hey, let's pull up the help file on uh, initial split just so you can see some of what I was just talking about. Okay, so initial split, you can see it wants a data set, and then prop is the proportion that goes into the testing set. You can also do it with um, as a stratified set. There's other options you can look into as well. 
all that lies ahead for me as I start as I keep recording these videos. Okay, also notice that AQ split is a list of four, and the first element of that list is just the data set, and then the other elements are just storing some data about what the uh, which rows are going to be in the test set, which rows are going to be in the training set. Okay, great. So I'm going to be doing a bunch of stuff with AQ train. I'm going to want to build a model and talk about that model at length, diagnose it, etc. And uh, then at the end, I want to go back and apply the model to AQ test to kind of see how it performs. And I'll do that using root mean squared error. So I'm going to want to build the model, of course, but even before I do that, I should uh, visualize the data, if I can type properly. So when you're working with um, a manageable size data set, a reasonable number of variables, if at all possible, you should try and visualize your data. That's particularly important with a linear regression where the assumption is, well, linearity, that the data actually has a linear shape. We would like to make sure that applies here. Okay, so let's use a ggplot. And since I loaded up tidy models earlier, I have access to ggplot. I want to use aq train. I'll be using aq train exclusively for a while. And on the x axis, I want wind. On the y axis, I want temp. Let's just start with the geom point and see how that looks. Okay, there we go. So the main thing that we're looking for here is just that the data has a vaguely linear shape. We don't want to see it look like a parabola or, uh, or something that is extremely nonlinear. If that were the case, the linear model wouldn't really be appropriate. We would want to think about uh, whether we wanted to do something a little bit more sophisticated before just plugging into LM. Uh, I think before I go any further, I am going to do a, uh, a theme set of theme minimal so that I can get rid of this gray background. I'm always a little happier when I uh, have that white background. Okay, since I have a generally linear shape here, I feel justified in actually putting a regression line into my model, into my visualization. So let's do geom smooth method, method equals quote LM to put that regression line on there. Maybe I'll even zoom in on it. When I record these videos, I try and keep my R Studio fairly tight, fairly zoomed in so that you can see if you're watching on your phone. But uh, that means that it's a little bit awkward <laughs> navigating between these different panes. Okay, so here we are seeing the line of best fit that's in blue. We're also getting a, a, an error ribbon here. So that's sort of a 95% confidence interval for the, uh, for the predicted mean for any given X value. I'll have a tiny bit more to say about that later on. If we want to remove that, we can by adding SE equals false, and that'll take that out. Okay, so preliminarily speaking, is preliminarily a word? We feel okay about a linear model here. So let's go ahead and build it. So building the model, and I'll be discussing it too, but I guess I don't need that in here. Okay, so the basic command I'm going to get, I'm going to use to build this linear model is LM. And I use model notation when I'm putting in my formula here. So I put the response variable first, temp, and then I say a tilde and what I'm supposed to be explaining it with. What's the um, predictor variable? What's the explanatory variable? And in this case, it's wind. Then I have to let R know where to look for these variables. In this case, it is an AQ train. That's the data I'm using here. And if I just execute that command, I get a really simple printout that's going to give me essentially the equation of the regression line. 90.332 minus 1.199 times the wind speed. And that'll give me sort of the fitted value for the temperature. So that's a very minimalistic output. In practice, that's not nearly enough for us unless we're at a very introductory level. So the thing I'll do is instead save this as AQ, maybe I'll just save it as model. I don't need to be too creative in my naming or too specific in my naming. Okay, and um, this model object here that I just created is actually fairly sophisticated. So if you look at the model, it is a list of 12. 
I'm going to dive into some of that um, here. Let's just look at the names in that list. Okay, so we have the coefficients, we have the residuals, a number of other things. As with any list in R, we can see the components in that list with the dollar sign. So model dollar coefficients, for instance, gives me that intercept and slope again. I can also do model dollar residuals. And you can see there's 114 residuals here, one for every observation in this training data set. Last thing I'll show is model dollar fitted values. That's another one that's useful. So you can see the fitted values for each observation in the data set. What it's doing there is taking the wind speed, plugging into this equation to get a fitted value, a predicted temperature for that particular wind speed. All right, we can also apply certain functions to this model object. And I think by far the, the most commonly used is summary. So let's do a summary of this model. And that's going to give me a pretty extensive printout. So I'm going to make a little room in this, uh, in this viewer window here, in the console window. OK, so we have a lot of different information from this summary. First, just a reminder of the call we used. Second. We have a five number summary on the residuals here. So you already saw me do a printout. Here we're taking those um, 140, however many ver uh, observations we have, and just getting a five number summary. Then we have this nice little table with the um, coefficients. So you can see at the intercept uh, here of 90.3 and the slope of negative 1.2. And then down here, finally, we have some overall information assessing the model. So we have residual standard error, multiple R squared, and then an F statistic here. So um, I'm going to want to talk about nearly all of this in one way or another as we go through. Let's, um, for the moment though, just look at this coefficients table. I in particular want to focus on these new three columns that we didn't have in our basic LM printout. So we know that we have a finite number of observations from a much larger population. In this case, um, AQ train is 114 observations. So um, if we go out and we do another 114 observations of wind and temp and compute another regression line using the same techniques from this data, we're going to get a different intercept and a different slope here. How different can we reasonably expect them to be? That's what standard error is attempting to measure. Um, if we do this repeatedly, by how much can we reasonably expect this to change? So um, we know that, uh, that the sort of average distance by which a new result would vary would be a standard error away. Of course, more is possible, less is possible. It's all uh, random sampling. So. It's all probabilistic. OK, now we have a t value and a p value, pr parenthesis greater than absolute value of t. This is hypothesis testing. Specifically, r is testing a null hypothesis that the corresponding coefficient is 0 in the model. So null hypothesis, the true parameter for the slope corresponding to wind, that explanatory variable, is actually 0. Based on that null hypothesis, how likely is it that we would get a slope of something like 1.1986, negative that, um, just by chance, something that extreme or more extreme? So the t value is a test statistic measuring how far away from what we would expect this value is. So if the, under the null hypothesis, we expect a slope of 0. This is a test statistic of negative 5 which as a t-statistic is pretty big. The p-value then is saying what's the probability of getting a result at least that extreme. To get a slope at least this far away from 0 under the null hypothesis. And um, so the 1.23 times 10 to the negative 6 says this would only happen 1.23 times 10 to the negative 6 of the time. So highly, highly, highly unlikely. This lets us conclude that it is... Um, it's safe to conclude that in the larger population, the slope is not zero, which makes sense that there would be a, a relationship of some sort between temperature and wind speed. 
Okay, so similar statements apply to intercept. I think that's all I really want to say about this summary right now. Now, there are lots of other functions that can be applied to um, this model object. And um, they include fitted.values of the model, and that'll again just give you the printout of all the fitted values. You can do residuals. Let me also show you conf int of the model. And when I execute conf int, I get a 95% confidence interval for my estimate for each of these two coefficients. So based on the data that we have, um, with 95% confidence, we could say that the slope is in this range. We can set a different level if we want. So level equals 0.90, we can get a 90% confidence interval. If we allow ourselves to be wrong a little bit more of, the, more of the time, which is what we're doing when we have a lower level of confidence, we should be able to get a more narrow interval in each case. And, um, and you can see that that's the case here. Okay, great. So we have that. I guess I don't need to take that out. I think the, uh, the next thing I want to do is um, to get some diagnostic plots on this. And I'm going to use the plot function on this, so applying another function to my model. And when I hit return, I'm going to get a sequence of four diagnostic plots, each of which is going to help me determine if the assumptions of a linear regression model are truly being satisfied here. So um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit before I do, because it's going to need some space in order to plot this. So let's see if it works. So for my first plot, no, my margins are not right. So let me try making a little more space here. There we go. It still doesn't look good, but I'll zoom in. OK. So the first thing that it gives us is a residual plot. We have fitted values going left and right and residuals going up and down. So we should have one point on this plot for every observation in this data set, in the AQ train data set. The idea here is that we are testing, checking to see if the assumption that our variables have a generally linear relationship is actually plausible. Because what the residual plot is doing is essentially subtracting out the model we have and just kind of showing us what's left. And if the linear model actually captures the pattern of the data, we shouldn't have any really real pattern here left. More specifically, that red line down the middle, the curvy thing down the middle, should be more or less flat. If it looks more like a parabola or, uh, or a hyperbola or something, it's showing a potential flaw in your model and you uh, have to make a decision about whether you're going to, uh, to live with the imperfect model or try and get something a little bit more refined. Okay, so that's the first assumption of a linear regression model, that there is a linear relationship between the variables. The other plots that we're going to get are going to help us check some of the other assumptions. So the second one we're going to get is a QQ plot of the residuals. So the second assumption of a linear regression model is that the residuals have a normal distribution. So what we're seeing here is a QQ plot, a quantile-quantile plot. On the horizontal axis, we're putting the quantiles of a standard normal distribution. And on the vertical axis, we're putting sort of the observed quantiles that we have here in the form of standardized residuals. And if, in fact, the residuals from this model have a normal distribution, then all these points should lie more or less along this line, y equals x. And in this case, you can see that that's a reasonable assumption. Um, the points depart a little bit on the ends. That's not unusual in a QQ plot like this. I'm not going to say too, too much about this. I have a whole vid on QQ plots. If you want to dive deeper, even deeper, I'll throw a link to that up top. Let's move on to the next plot here. The next one we're going to get is a scale location plot. So here on the x-axis, we again have fitted values. We're again going to have one observation, sorry, one point on this plot for every observation in our data set. This time on the y-axis, we have the square root of a standardized residual. So this is a measure of how far away each observation is from what was expected in a standardized way. And you can see that the numbers go from 0 to 1.5. And you can think of these like standard deviations almost. They're um, almost like t-statistics. 
So um, again, we are looking for a more or less flat line here. The assumption that we're checking for is that of homoscedasticity. I think I pronounced that right for once. This assumption says that for every um, value of, or combination of values of explanatory variable or variables, you should have um, the same spread for the data in the response variable. Um, that is, we should have, um, we should be not having sort of a horn shape in this graph or anything like that, or um, uh, a sort of dumbbell shape where there's a lot more spread at one end or in the middle. Again, in this case, we seem to have a pretty good, uh, a pretty flat line, so we seem to be pretty good in terms of that assumption. All right, so I've mentioned three assumptions of linear regression. There's a fourth that we're not actually going to be able to check here, and that's uh, independence. So in a linear regression model, all of the observations are assumed to be independent of one another. And this isn't so much something that you check with technology. This is a question of study design. In this case, Technically speaking, this data was collected from a time series, and so there's going to be some degree of dependence between one observation and the next. We are explicitly choosing to ignore that for this analysis, while acknowledging that's probably not entirely appropriate. Now, there is one more plot here that uh, plot model will give us. Let's take a look at it. It's not specifically checking an assumption of an official assumption of a linear regression, but um, it's a, another important thing to take into consideration nonetheless. Here we're getting a residuals versus leverage plot. What we're doing here is we're considering the question of whether there are any problematic outliers within this data set. A, um, a, a specific observation that might have too large an influence on the model. So leverage is essentially a question about the x values of our observation. If a data point has an x value that's way far away, that's way different from most of the values in our set, that value, that, value, that observation is potentially going to have high leverage. Well, it does have high leverage. Um, it potentially has high influence on the model. This is um, something we want to watch out for, because if one or two observations have a lot of influence on our model, maybe the model isn't reflecting most of our data the way that we might want. So if you look closely, you can see the words Cook's distance here next to a more solid dotted line. In this case, we don't have any problematic outliers. If we did, there would be sort of a diagonal hard dotted line in here somewhere and uh, potentially a point that lies outside of it. And if there were a point that, lied out, that were to lie outside of it, that would potentially be a problematic outlier. Okay, so um, in this case, the model diagnostics look pretty good. We can feel pretty comfortable with our model. So let's go ahead and move on now. I, um, I want to look at this model object in a little more depth using the broom package. And I sometimes load that up on its own when I'm doing a linear mo a linear regression model without doing all of tidy models. You can get it on your own, of course. Um, the broom package includes three functions that are each extremely helpful for a different reason. And to illustrate the need for such a package or for such functions, I'm just going to reprint out this model summary that we had. This printout is very useful, a lot of good information in here, but it is not tidy. And if you have a little bit of experience with data in R, you're a big fan of things that are tidy. We like data frames where every row is an observation and every column is a variable. We do not have that here. Even worse, this printout is giving us several different kinds of information all at once. Obviously, the call. We have this table here about the coefficients. Um, that then is right above a completely different kind of information, which is some information on the overall performance of the model. So the idea of the broom package is to have one function to extract each of these different things. The, uh, the first one that I'll show you is tidy. So let's tidy this model. And we just get a neat little data frame with our intercept, wind, or intercept, slope, and then estimate, standard error, and so on. So it's essentially this little table here, but in an explicit format, or it's explicitly a tibble, a data frame. So if I'm generating multiple models, for instance, um, 
for potentially using different techniques, I can build a larger data frame and start doing great things with this using ggplot, per, and other functional programming tools. Uh, the next one I want to show is glance. Let's glance at this model. So here we're getting things like r squared and um, adjusted r squared p value a AIC and so on. This is going to be similar information to what we're getting at this in this bottom paragraph of our summary output. Some stuff about the overall performance of the model just as it pertains to this training data set. Um, so that's nice. Again, it's a tibble. The final one is actually the one I maybe use the most. It's augment. And this is going to give us information sort of at the observation level. So we're going to have one row in this data frame for every observation in this training data set. It's going to be pretty large. So um, I'm going to want to save this and not just print it out. So I think I'll save it as um, AQ aug. And uh, let's just take a look at that. Let's view AQ aug. And again, it's a data frame. OK, so. It starts with temp and wind, and those are the variables from the air quality data set that are actually in our model. Response and then explanatory. Oops. The other ones in our in the air quality data set have been left out, so month, day, ozone, and solar radiation. Those aren't relevant to the model we're looking at, so um, the augment function doesn't, doesn't consider them. And then for every observation in the data set, we have a number of pieces of information, the fitted value and the residual, um, as well as a number of other things. So the hat value is going to measure the leverage of the point. Again, that's uh, talking about how extreme the value's x value is, the value of the explanatory variable, not particularly taking into account the value of the y, the output, the response variable. The sigma here is giving you some measure of the influence of that observation. So if this observation were subtracted from the model, what kind of residual standard deviation would we have? Cook's distance, or Cook's d, is something we already saw in that diagnostic plot. This is, again, measuring how influential an observation is. And then finally, we have standardized residuals. OK, great. I find that to be extremely useful. By the way, since we have a nice data frame with fitted and residual values, we could now use ggplot to make a really nice residual plot. And I have a whole video on doing that. I'll throw a link to that up top. Oh, last thing I'll say before I get off of uh, AQ aug. Notice the dot fitted and dot resid. They put the dot in there in case you uh, have a variable over here that's already called, for instance, fitted or residual or hat, which isn't beyond, uh, beyond reality. It's very unlikely, however, that you have a variable named dot hat, for instance. OK, so um, let's move on now and check our model performance. Um, model performance. I guess I haven't capitalized any of my other things here, so let's leave that uncapitalized. All right, so my basic tool is going to be the predict command, which I haven't shown you anything about yet. So first of all, <laughs> let's talk about predict. I'll make a little space here. Predict wants the model itself. That's the first and only thing it really needs. And let's just hit return and see what happens. So we got 114 values out. So what it's doing is it's taking this model, which was built on 114 observations, and just giving back fitted values. So this is the same as fitted dot values right now. The point of predict, however, is that it should be able to give us back information on new observations. and. Um, the syntax for that is to pass it first the model and then a data frame that has the new observations in it. So in this case, we already have one. It's AQ test. So let's do that. Here we get 39, observ 39 values out, one for each observation in the AQ test data set. Now, this second argument does have to be a data frame, AQ test. You can't just pass it a bunch of wind values. And the data frame that you pass it has to have a variable with exactly the same name or names as the explanatory variable or variables in the original data set. So here the explanatory variable is wind. Obviously, AQ test has that value. 
Okay, we can uh, also get a little bit more information if we want. I think before I do anything else, let me show you. You can do uh, confidence intervals for this. Interval equals quote confidence. And now for each one of those observations, we get not only the fitted value for the wind speed given, but also a 95% confidence interval. So we get lower and upper values for that CI. We can also specify a different level of confidence. So this is supposed to be a 95% confidence interval for the average temperature for any for the specified wind speed. So we have to imagine getting lots and lots of observations with that same um, that same wind speed and saying what would the average temperature be. If you're just trying to get an interval for one new observation and not for that average, what you want is prediction. And these will be substantially wider because there's a lot more variability in a single observation than there is for an average of all future observations. OK, great. So we've got our predicted values, um, our fitted values for these particular wind speeds. What I'd like to do now to kind of wrap up this video is to see on this new data, how well is our model performing? That is, how well do our how do our predictions compare to the actual values in this data set? Remember, AQ test is a full part of this air quality data set, so we don't just have wind values, like the ones that were used to compute these fitted values. We also have all the other variables, including temp. So I'm going to take the differences between the temps in the data set and the ones predicted by this model and see how they compare. And I'm going to do that using a measure called root mean squared error, which is a pretty standard way of um, checking the accuracy of a regression model like this one. So for root mean squared error, I'm going to take each of the observed values. So that's AQ test dollar temp and subtract off the fitted value. So how about predict model comma AQ test. Obviously, there's lots of ways I could have gotten that. And the idea is I'm going to want to somehow take the average of all of these. But if I just take the average right now, I'm going to get zero. Some are too high, some are too low. It's going to be very close to zero. It won't be exactly zero on a, on a testing set. So I'm going to take this thing that I've already got and I'm going to square it. That'll make everything big. It'll make everything positive. It'll also uh, change the scale on things, but we'll fix that later. And then after I do that, I want to take the average. So we'll take a mean. Again, this won't be on the same scale as my original data because everything's been squared. So at the very end, I'll take a square root. 8.034. So this is our root mean squared error. Roughly speaking, this says on average, by how much do the new observation temperatures differ from those predicted by our model? So on average, roughly speaking, they're off by a little more than 8 degrees. Now, um, the phrase root mean squared error is more accurate than the word average. Average isn't quite right because we're doing this square before we do the mean and then taking a square root afterwards. But in terms of intuition, I think it's a good average is a pretty good word to use. I'm going to pull up this ggplot that we made earlier from the training data just for another second. Again, this is from the training data, but the regression line is our model. So you can imagine actually putting the new observations on this plot. We have, what, 39 of them. The root mean squared error is, roughly speaking, telling us how far in the vertical directions those new observations are from this line on average. So it is doing a, a, the job of telling us how well this model is fitting that new data in the testing set. Now, before we wrap up, let me pull up the summary of this model one more time. I'll resize my window so you can see it. Because the root mean squared error of 8 is actually a similar measure to what something we already have. And I just want to point this out before we wrap up. In our summary of this model, we got that the residual standard error was 8.602. What this is doing is computing, in a slightly different fashion, an estimate for how far off the model will be from observations um, and getting an average difference of 8.602. 
So compare that 8.602 to the 8.03 that we actually got. Um, in this case, that estimate ended up being a little bit higher than what it was on this testing set. Now, there's a lot that goes into that here. Our testing set was taken by random chance. So um, this is a measure that's computed exclusively from the training data. So it has the value that it's not trying to uh, take, in that, take into account that extra degree of randomity. This one, on the other hand, is using a slightly more, I guess, objective data set, it, this testing set that was not used in the construction of the model. In practice, it's this root mean squared error that you tend to look at more closely in evaluating a regression model.